It is hard to believe it's this time of the year already, but Friday night we were treated to live action with Carolina basketball, our first glimpse at the men's and women's North Carolina basketball teams for the upcoming year. Great environment, lots of great stuff to go, it on, go on with it, and sitting right there courtside was Matt Krause, and he's going to unpack it all for us on today's episode of Locked on Tar Heels. You are Locked On Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, it's Tuesday, October 11th, 2022. Welcome into the Locked On Tar Heels podcast, the only daily North Carolina show out there. I'm your host and joining me as we already talked about is Matt Krause, the voice of Carolina women's basketball. I want to thank you for making Locked on Tar Heels your first listen or your first watch every single day. Please don't forget the show is free and available anywhere you get podcasts so you can subscribe right now to make sure you don't miss a second of your team every single day. Well, as we said, Friday night, things got cracking with live action with Carolina basketball, the brand new name for late night for Carolina. And Matt Krause was there on the call that night. And so he's joining us today to kind of unpack things. We're gonna first start by talking about all, everything that was going on, big picture things, environment things. Then we're gonna talk about the men's team and then we're gonna talk about the women's team. We just get a whole, whole host of treatment. So Matt, thank you so much for joining us. What an incredible atmosphere that was Friday evening. Hey, Isaac, I appreciate it. Yeah, it was fun. You know, delayed a week, obviously, yeah. due to the impacts of Hurricane Ian. So no home football game is as traditional the day after the event. But still, you felt that rush of energy the moment they opened the doors. And folks that never really get the chance to sit courtside make that annual sprint <laughs> down the down the side of the, the seats there. And it's always fascinating with this event year in and year out how no one falls on their face during that time. Were you and Kyle already out there watching as as the doors opened? Oh, yeah, we were sitting there. We were courtside. And, you know, like I said, it's like, oh, my gosh, here they all come. I got to duck and cover, make sure no one comes falling on top of me, right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. And thankfully, uh, it seems like you guys made it out unscathed from that moment. Well, man, these are two teams with big-time expectations this season. Carolina women coming off a Sweet 16 run, giving South Carolina everything they could handle. And the guys, obviously, coming off of that national championship run, falling just short to Kansas in that national championship game. And so it, it seems like you're, you're already saying that a little bit, but, but did you feel that, that anticipation, that, that excitement in the building? Absolutely. You know, like last year, it was kind of this sense of a little bit of unknown just coming off of the pandemic and with Coach Davis's first season. But now this year, there's expectations given where the men's program reached all the way to the final four, reaching the national championship game in year one under coach. And I joked on the broadcast, my gosh, he set the bar high for himself. <laughs> and then with Coach Banghart's team, by far the most anticipation for a women's basketball season in her tenure and most anticipation for women's basketball at Carolina in quite some time. And that was just kind of the general theme of the night anticipation. And that's a good word. And that, that is the thing is can both of these teams not only deal with that anticipation, but with that target and that expectation set on them. As things got settled in a little more with co year two for Coach Davis, year four for Coach Banghart, does it feel did it feel to you like there was a little bit more of a known entity as compared to last year? Yeah, for sure. You know, last year it was that emotional moment when Coach Davis came out to center court and gave the speech about what it means to be the head coach of the University of North Carolina. And, and so many people say this, and I, I believe it to be true, that no one loves this university, this town, this basketball program, this athletics program, quite like Hubert Davis. And that's why he was the perfect man for the job. And so there was that moment last year, but this year it's it's okay. It, it's not Welcome to the new era. This used to be late night with Roy. What is it now? Obviously now live action. That's an emphasis on, on just how much Hubert and his style has, you know, kind of made his way into our lexicon as Carolina fans and <laughs> Carolina uh, observers. Yes, absolutely. 
And also, it was the second year for in-game arena host B Dot, the just the wacky, fun-loving guy who uh, we've come to know and love over this past year, who deems himself the uh, sixth man of Carolina basketball, the biggest fan in the building. But as Carolina fans now come to expect a little more of what he's bringing to the table. How does what the energy that he brings help unify everyone there, help move everyone with one voice? Well, I, I think everyone's moving because he's instructing <laughs> everyone how to swag surf. I, I've got to say, <laughs> did, we did not participate on that at the broadcast table. Um, we, we spared ourselves from the public embarrassment of me and Kyle trying to dance. Um, it's fair. But, you know, it's one of those things where he's kind of, a unifying voice because as he says, he's a super fan. He just happens to be a fan with a microphone who has the ability to relate to so many of those folks that are in the seats and be able to identify with, you know, their emotions on a game in game out level and to be able to kind of, to spread that energy throughout the Smith center. It's really cool to see. Man. Yeah, that's fantastic. And one of the interesting things you talked about you and Kyle on the broadcast originally when it was going to be last week, we were expecting to see Marcus Ginyard sitting there with you guys for the men's portion of things. And then lo and behold, who pops up Garrison Brooks. And so it was a, first of all, really neat. I'm sure for Carolina fans to see him there back in the building, following a year gone playing for his dad at Mississippi state. How did that uh, change of events come to be? Yeah, well, the original plan, like you said, Marcus Ginyard, who did, did the broadcast with us last year, he was slated to be on again this year, but then he had a conflict when the date of the event was moved back a week. And so it was back to the drawing board and back to asking the basketball program who might be someone that would be available and interested. And Garrison's name came up. He was in town prior to heading up to New York. Uh, he's going to be playing for the Westchester Knicks, the New York Knicks G League affiliate this season. So certainly wish him best of luck. But he he has an interest in potentially getting into broadcasting down the road when his playing career is over. And I thought he was really, really impressive. You know, obviously he's a great personality. I think fans got to see a little bit of that during his career. And he was able to bring some of that out and share his knowledge of the game. I really, really enjoyed working with him. And that certainly came through on the broadcast for those who are watching as well. So you guys did a great job welcoming, welcoming him in, you and Kyle did. Speaking of which, I know this is still like a, a formal broadcast for you. And, you know, you want to do very well on the program and all of that. But it, it feels like it has to be a little more laid back atmosphere, a little more just able to, to enjoy the vibe of the night and lean into that a little bit. Is that, is that a fair statement to make? Absolutely. You know, it, it's the one real event all year that we do where you don't know kind of what's coming next. When, when you do any sort of a, a game broadcast, you know how a, a soccer game or a baseball game is going to play out. And then, you know, I, I joke, it's the only time any uh, at any point in the year where I can show up to an ACC network broadcast wearing a Carolina tie because we call it right down the middle. Uh, even though the games are school produced for Olympic sports, but obviously live action is a, it's a Carolina centric show. And and so that, uh, like you said, it promotes more of a laid back kind of fun loving atmosphere versus a traditional hardcore X's and O's game broadcast. Yeah, man, that's, that's great for you guys to get, just have moments like that as broadcasters sometimes where you get to be a little more homery as it were. And so that's, that's lots of fun. Now, we also know these events are big time opportunities to have recruits in the house. Some things change similar to Marcus Ginyard's plans because of the delay of live action, but the Tar Heels were still able to have several guys in and Elliot Cadeau, Jaron Stevenson and Drake Powell, who is one of the most recent commits to the men's program. How do you think and I know I'm asking you to put on the on the glasses or the lens of a recruit, how do you think they see this event and experience it as recruits? Yeah, I mean, obviously, as a uh, as a broadcaster for the team, I'm not allowed to comment on individual recruits. But I <laughs> right. tell you what, if you are a prospect that is interested in playing for Carolina and has that mutual interest from the program, being able to see that atmosphere just for a, you know, I say just for a preseason tip off event. It's not like it's an actual game. There's not another opponent in there. And just to see that loyalty in the fan base 
to be able to show up even on a week's delay, still come from far and wide to be able to see their team and, and feel that love. I think it's a great introduction. That's wonderful. And obviously, Matt, I certainly don't want to get you in trouble by naming names. So thank you for uh, doing the anonymous thing that you have to do. But I'm not under such structures. And so uh, I can do it. But thank you for uh, towing the line that you are supposed to tow. We're going to get more into talking about the men's side of this event in just a second, right after I tell you about Upside. From cringing at the pump to getting an eye-popping check at your favorite restaurant, inflation is hitting us all where it hurts. And boy, it hurts. That's why I started using the Upside app. Upside is an incredible app for anyone who buys gas, groceries, or dines out. With every purchase, I'm earning cash back thanks to Upside. I legitimately, Isaac is saying this, I legitimately use this app every time I fill it with gas and it saved me so much money in this summer of crazy prices at the gas pump. It really does work and very easy. To get, start, to get started, use the free Upside app. Use my promo code LOCKED to get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. Next, claim an offer for whatever you're buying on Upside. Check in at the business, pay as usual with a credit or debit card, and get paid. In comparison to credit card rewards or loyalty programs, you can earn three times more cash back with Upside. Upside users are earning more than a million dollars every week, and that's probably why the app has a 4.8 star rating on the App Store. Again, download the free Upside app and use promo code LOCKED to get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. That's $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more using promo code LOCKED. Okay, Matt, so let's uh, kind of jump ahead chronologically here and we'll come back and talk about the women's team in just a second. Now, for the men, and, and this is true of both teams actually, because it is this more laid back event that we've talked about, you don't want to risk any any injuries unnecessarily and so for the guys they were missing Caleb Love one of the starters along with Puff Johnson and incoming freshman freshman Jalen Washington now uh, these guys for them who aren't actually playing it it allows them a little bit of a different way to enjoy the night for example Caleb Love we saw at one point grab a camera and he's taking pictures how is that a different experience for them versus the guys who are actually playing yeah, I think it was kind of a display of how much Caleb Love has grown to, pardon the pun, but become a player that these fans love. You know, you yeah. think about the lineage of the the Carolina point guard that wears number two, as cliche as that sounds. And there was a lot of pressure on him heading into last year. You know, he was, like we said, splitting the point guard duties with R.J. Davis into last season and coming off of that freshman year and the COVID year where the Tar Heels reached the NCAA tournament but lost in the first round to Wisconsin. And then there was a little bit of, of doubt among the fan base, obviously. I think a little bit might be an understatement heading into <laughs> the middle to late portion of last season. And then it's just that that run you know, when you think about it, it wasn't one of those years where like the ACC tournament was in Brooklyn last year, for example. And then the Tar Heels didn't have a high enough seed to earn a, a preferential seeding in terms of geography in the NCAA tournament. So it was New York City, Texas, Philadelphia, New Orleans. So in, in terms of an actual basketball setting, even going back to the Duke game at Cameron, there hasn't been a the last time that there was a Carolina basketball event in the Smith Center with the players involved, it was the Syracuse game, senior night, where Caleb hit that big three. And just That's so right. much has changed in terms of the relationship of the Iron Five and that program and Coach Davis since the last time there were live basketball players out there on the floor. And I think you saw that on display with just kind of how they were able to relax and enjoy that, that newfound love and attention from the fan base. <laughs> Newfound love, indeed. Another uh, wonderful play on his surname there. Way, way to go, Matt. <laughs> and and one of the th things that was a joy of that is after that run Carolina had made to the Final Four, that means new banners in the roof. The ceiling is the roof, as Michael Jordan once so famously said a couple years ago. And as Carolina was being introduced on Friday night, the last man up was Mr. Rayshon Leakey Black. And as he came up, rose up on the uh, the device that was bringing all the players into the arena, 
out he unfurls the final four banner. And I got to tell you, Kyle, I, Kyle Matt, um, we had just seen a, a glimpse on the broadcast of his mom, Miss Carla Black, and then up comes Leaky and into his fifth year, you know it's going to be the end no matter what happens. He's, he's exhausting his eligibility here. And it just was an emotional moment. And then on top of that, for him to unfurl this banner and, and let the, the gathered crowd feel that and celebrate it together for the first time back in the Smith Center, as you just said, what did that moment feel like inside the arena? That was a really cool moment because the the physical banner is already up there in the rafters. So it's not like an unfurling or a raising of the banner. And so you wondered kind of if there was going to be any sort of connection to that banner rather than just have a maintenance worker having put it up before <laughs> the event. And and then Leaky shows up and, and, and he's one of those guys that's been through an awful lot in his that's career right. um, now heading into year five. You know, he, he was part of that. Uh, that Sweet 16 team in, in 2019, and then was part of the really rough year right before the pandemic, obviously, then the Coach Williams final year w- that we've talked about with the, the loss to Wisconsin, and now coming out of that valley back toward the peak and, and being able to enjoy that that appreciation from the fan base. He, he was pretty much the only choice to be the guy to to take part in that little banner ceremony. And what a, what a way to represent what Carolina basketball is all about. Love that. Love that in a big way. Now, we get to the actual playing of the scrimmage, and the teams are slightly unbalanced, at least in terms of starters. You have, obviously, Caleb Love is not playing, but it's the other four projected starters along with DeMarco Dunn matching up against Seth Trimble, Will Shaver, Dontress Styles, Tyler Nickel, and Justin McCoy. And so, you know, the, the game itself was a little bit of a blowout. There were some scores late to, to bring it up to that 61-47 final score. But just from where you sat, what were some of your takeaways from the actual gameplay? Well, number one, Armando can still rebound, so <laughs> that's good to see. Uh, no, all jokes aside, I would expect more of the same from him this year. Uh, I think Pete Nance is going to be a, a really, really impressive player. Um, he is bigger than Brady Manick, will mm-hmm. not shoot the three at sure. the rate Brady Manick will, but also I don't think it's going to be a too big lineup, as in TWO big, <laughs> you know, the, the, like, like we saw under, you can never be too big in the sport of basketball, right. POO big, um, but y- you know, homophones, it, exactly. Um, it's not going to be a traditional Roy Williams offense right. where right. he would play those two post players. Uh, Pete Nance has got the ability to play out in the perimeter with his size and he's a really good complement to Armando. So then you wonder, okay, where is some of that three point production going to come from? And you don't want to overreact to one scrimmage, but gosh, I was impressed by Tyler Nickel uh, yes. among the incoming freshmen. You knew he could score. He's the all-time leading scorer in Virginia public high school history, and you knew that about him. But then for him to go on display and, and be able to knock down several shots from three, um, really, really impressed by him. So I think the Tar Heels are going to have to get him some playing time pretty early and often, and you know, it's his job to kind of run with it as, as a key member of the rotation coming off the bench. Yes, absolutely. And Pete Nance himself has even talked about what, what you were just saying there, Matt, that, hey, I project to be more of a four in the NBA at the next level. And so I really need to lean into that, although he had been a five at Northwestern. So this is a great opportunity for him. And you're spot on with that. Like if Tyler Nichols going to hit at that rate. Coach Davis isn't going to be able to keep him on the bench. In fact, this is a funny, quick anecdote, but I had interviewed him this summer on the podcast, and he told me he was a four-level scorer, not not your typical (laughs) three-level scorer. And so, uh, yes, Tyler Nichols certainly has some moxie and swagger and and just came out gunning, and you love to see that. I believe was the second leading scorer behind only R.J. Davis, who's going to be the engine that makes this thing go. Uh, Something that happened to the delight, I think, of most of the Carolina fan base is uh, a week or two ago, Bo May, another bro, uh, Bo May is a sibling of both Luke and Drake. Hard to believe that we get another May in the mix at the same time. Uh, But then he comes out and bangs back to back threes right before halftime and I believe scored one more bucket in the second half. And I'm just curious what the reaction to him felt like in the building. 
uh, you know, we have the ability to uh, chat with the control room when the broadcast goes to break. And, and what I said when we hit the halftime of that scrimmage was, well, OK, you're bringing back four starters off a team that went to the national championship game last year. And the highlight we showed going to break was the newest walk on. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if it's anybody else other than another May, that's probably not the case. But the Smith Center loved it. Um, and by the way, that jump shot, gosh, it looks awfully familiar. Um, it he does. Is, he is a spitting image of his older brother right down to the beard, too. Yeah. And, and I don't know if he will get or get much playing time or see the court too often. But just given the way he carried himself and and. Uh, held his own in that environment. Uh, and as you have said, we can't read too much into a scrimmage of this nature, but I think there's certainly going to be the opportunity for him to get some run here and there. And then, of course, his brother goes out and has another 300-yard passing game the next day down in Miami. Great to see it. Well, next, we're going to get into talking about the women's scrimmage and what we saw from that right after I tell us about Nissan. Our partners at Nissan have worked with us here at Locked On to create a new segment across the Locked On College Network titled Thrilling Moments, where we highlight the most exciting play from this weekend's victory, which this time was over Miami. So the thrilling moment from this game was the Josh Downs touchdown. It came immediately on the, forgive me, heels of a fourth and nine conversion. Just two plays later, Drake May, who we just talked about, somehow is able to get a pass off, kind of a fadeaway, as he's got a defender diving at his feet. Josh Downs catches it across the middle, runs backwards away from the end zone to avoid a defender, plants his foot on the 10, dives forward in between two defenders for the touchdown, giving Carolina their third touchdown of the day, a 21-7 lead, which they were ultimately able to hold on to down the stretch. This segment has been inspired by the thrilling new designs featured across Nissan's new lineup of vehicles. Pursue what thrills you in the all-new Frontier, Armada, or Pathfinder today. Available now at NissanUSA.com. All right, Matt, let's shift our attention now to talking about the women's team, which you get a very close and upside view at throughout the season. And so really excited to hear your thoughts on these ladies. And, and the place I want to start is not with the players, but with Coach Banghart, just coming out with this bold declaration, I'm wearing white because we're going to be hosting the first two rounds of the NCAA tournament. And just quickly before Matt answers, for those who are unaware, the women, as opposed to the men, don't play at neutral site locations throughout the NCAA tournament. In the first two rounds, it is the better seated team that gets to host at their location. And so that's why she's able to say that and what that means. Matt, what, what did that inspire in you? And what does that inspire in the young ladies who play for her? Well, it got me excited. That's for sure. It's going to be much more convenient if the Tar Heels can play the, the first two <laughs> rounds at Carmichael Arena, which That's is, right. I don't know, maybe a, a 10 minute drive with traffic from where I live comp uh, compared to that five hour flight to Tucson last year. <laughs> uh, we, we enjoyed our time in Tucson. But yeah, it, it's one of those things that that's been a goal of the program in a, in a private setting. But to mm -hmm. take it to the public level helps to align the ever-growing women's basketball fan base with the goals of the team. And so obviously we'll get into more of you know what projects of the season to come. But if if you can get the fan base that excited from the get-go to help pack Carmichael Arena in the regular season to help experience and understand what a great environment in Carmichael is to make fans, both students and the general public and some of the season ticket holders that have been through the program through thick and thin that are so important to Carolina women's basketball, to help them understand what that moment could be like. You just help to build up that, that momentum in the fan base, but also to be able to help the players understand, okay, you know, this, this is what this arena and this program can be like. You've got to go out there and earn it between the lines. Absolutely. And I loved your idea on Twitter. I think you quote tweeted something about it and said, let's get a wide out going. I love that idea. Not just Coach Banghart, not just the players. Let's wide out Carmichael Arena and make that happen. That would be awesome to see. Oh, yeah, for sure. You, you know, the, the student sections were great last year. And to to imagine that is kind of a culmination. It, it's something that, that dances in your mind. But, oh, gosh, you got to go earn it. 
Yes, absolutely you do. Now let's get right into talking about the actual scrimmage. For the ladies, 12 players on the team, four of them were sitting out, some at, at different levels of injury and, and coming back from that. Uh, but you had Alyssa Utsby out, Kayla McPherson, Tiani Key, and Ariel Young. And so that meant you just had eight players available for what ended up having to become a bit of an abbreviated scrimmage, four on four, two four minute segments. And so um, what, what did you see? See, Matt, same kind of question I asked about the guys. What what was your takeaway from this four-on-four -four environment? Yeah, again, very similar to the guys. It's one of those things where you don't want to push any players in particular too hard in a, an exhibition setting. And, and so the team was a little bit rusty trying to understand kind of the mechanics of a four-on-four -on -four <laughs> scrimmage and how that would work. But, you know, Kennedy Todd Williams wound up stealing the show down the stretch. Um I have believed essentially from day one since she's gotten to Carolina that she is a player who is underappreciated on the national level. Her ability to do it all, both scoring and defending, you know, Courtney Banghart says she's one of the best on ball defenders she's ever coached in the country currently. You know, just throw out any sort of superlative there. Um, <laughs> but then Todd Williams really took that step being able to to score the basketball at a, at a more efficient rate last year. But the one area of her game that was a little inconsistent was the ability to knock down the outside shot. So what do we see on display in the scrimmage Friday night? We see her starting to heat up from three, and that, that's an element of her game that if that can become more consistent, she'll be even more dangerous. And I think that that was a kind of a public statement saying, okay, I put the work in because I know she has. I've seen it throughout the offseason, and uh, she can have an even bigger season where hopefully, hopefully this time, She'll get some love in the all ACC voting. Yes, come on, voters. Let's do work. We're talking with Matt Kraus, the voice of Carolina women's basketball on the play by play there. And so, if Kennedy Todd Williams is, in fact, able to take those multiple three pointers we saw on Friday night, multiple made three pointers, and uh, extrapolate that out into the season, what does it open up for the rest of the team? Well, for one thing, it's more, uh, more freedom offensively for Carolina because. If opposing defenses are going to have to pay more attention to Todd Williams on the outside, that's less attention that they're going to be able to pay to Deja Kelly getting into the mid-range. We know how good she is around the elbows. Yes. Uh, that, that's where she can really, really heat up. And she can get hot from three as well. You just think back to the the personal 12 nothing run that she had four possessions against Miami last year. Yeah. So yeah. that's an option too. And it also opens up the ability to score down low, especially if Tiani Key can become uh, the factor that we think she can possibly be yeah. in yeah. this first year where she's able to play uh, in, a, in a fully healthy manner after sitting out last season due to the preseason injury. So just, just more space on the floor, and th yeah. that's a word that Coach Banghart loves to use is space and being able to stretch out the defense, and Todd Williams adding the range certainly has the possibility to do that. Yes, and in all our silly wordplay today, Tiani certainly could be a key to all of that. We're Let's just we're just letting that. it ride today, Matt. We're just letting it ride. Now, similar to the guys, uh, the women's team is needing to replace one of their starters in Carly Littlefield, who brought so much to this team, both in terms of her on-court play as well as her leadership and having spent so much time in her collegiate career with Coach Banghart. How will this team go about replacing that this season? Well, you know, like you said, Isaac, it's a kind of a two-headed monster how the Tar Heels go about replacing her because there's the leadership aspect and then there's the on-court aspect. Leadership-wise is the big question mark because it was Littlefield who had spent all that time with Coach Banghart and Jalen Murray, who was the longest mm -hmm. tenured member of the program, didn't play all that much due to a variety of factors, mainly injury late in her career. But the two of them were such great vocal leaders who had walked the walk. They had been in those <laughs> tough circumstances, and they were able to pull this team through last year. So replacing them is going to be difficult. So you got to count on players like um, Malucha Tenge, who is now the longest tenured member of the program, Ariel Young, a senior as well, and Eva Hodgson now in year two. So it, especially if you see those upperclassmen, but also players who were in that class that came in in the class of 2020 – now in their junior seasons, you know, just just who kind of picks up that leadership void is going to be a big question, especially if you hit some adversity at some juncture early on in the season. In terms of the on-court production, 
look for a couple of different names. One familiar in Eva Hodgson, who was the sixth player last year, had some big moments off the bench, especially that three against Virginia Tech in the ACC tournament. Yes. Ultimately, the Hokies pulled out the win in that one in overtime, but game would have even gone to overtime if Eva had knocked down sure. that awesome shot. But then also the new name. There is one freshman on this <laughs> roster. That's it. It's Paulina Paris. She wears number two. So what did we say about Tar Heels and point guards and number <laughs> two? Right. Something about that? That's Quick right, little, man. Uh, synergy between the men's and women's program. But uh, Paulina is so explosive. Um, she she can be a three-level scorer, but I think her best asset early on is her ability to drive to the bucket um, at, at such quick pace. And so I would expect her to see some playing time and be part of this rotation very early on in her career. And uh, she'll she'll provide some of that scoring ability and then some more from what we saw to Carly Littlefield. Man, oh man, Matt Krause, thank you so much for all that insight and wisdom on both teams as well as the overall view of the evening. It's hard to believe that we are less than a month from these teams tipping off for the men. Their first game is on November 7th for the ladies two nights later on November 9th. It's going to be a great week again, just less than a month away from now. As for today, that is it for this episode of Locked on Tar Heels. We want to invite you to join us in our Drive for Five, where we're moving towards 5,000 YouTube subscribers. We're doing a weekly drawing each week of October leading up to the basketball season. If you would like to win a Carolina bucket hat, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel and you will be entered into a drawing for this coming Saturday. Coming up on tomorrow's show, Coach Pat Kilby joins me and we are going to preview Mr. Bo May, who we talked about just a little bit earlier. I want to thank you for locking in with us today. Please subscribe to the show, smash the like button, leave some great comments on your thoughts. And if you want to get notified every time a new episode drops, just hit that bell. You can follow me on Twitter at Isaac Shade. You can follow Matt at Mount Matt Krause PXP. Play by play. Love that. And you can follow the show at Locked on Heels. Get more on the ACC by making Locked on ACC your second listen of the day. Host Candace Cooper and the local experts of Locked on take you around the conference in 30 minutes, five days a week. Matt and I really appreciate you joining us to unpack live action with Carolina basketball, and we hope that you have a great day. And we want to remind you that it is always a great day to be at Tar Heel. Until tomorrow, peace.